Today's episode is brought to you by Hillsdale. Please visit hillsdale.edu slash WW2 podcast to get exclusive access to their new course on Winston Churchill. Hello and welcome to another World War II podcast. By the end of June in 1940, the Battle of France was over. The British Army had been plucked from the beaches of Dunkirk. Much of its heavy equipment had been left abandoned in France. It looked like Britain would be the next target for the Nazi war machine. Having witnessed the debacle in France, a betting man might have put his money on the Germans when it came to invading England. On the 14th of May 1940, Anthony Eden called on men between 17 and 65 in Britain who were not in military service but wished to defend their country to enrol in the local defence volunteers. By July, over 1.5 million Britons had volunteered. Another group was also created, a clandestine army that, in the event of invasion, will be called upon. Britain will be the first nation to have a pre-planned resistance network. They went under the unassuming name of Auxiliary or Orgs Units. I'm joined by Tom Sykes from the Coles Hill Auxiliary Research Team. Tom, thanks for joining me. So the Auxiliary Units, were, were they a spin-off from the Home Guard? Well, I, I wouldn't use the phrase spin-off. No, they were they were pr- properly premeditated and planned by by Churchill. You know, it was under under Churchill's order. Quite a few Home Guard people, uh, the guys were were recruited into Orcs units, but they were a completely separate organisation. So, is it all Churchill's idea? Was he he came up with it? Churchill made an instruction, uh, and he said the regular defences required supplementing with guerrilla type troops who will allow themselves to be overrun and who thereafter will be responsible for hitting the enemy in the comparatively soft spots behind zones of concentrated attack. And he later, on the 25th of September, wrote to Anthony Eden and said, I've been following with much interest the growth and development of the new guerrilla formations known as auxiliary units. From what I hear, these units are being organised with thoroughness and imagination and should, in the event of invasion, prove a useful addition to the regular forces. So where, where did they um, where did they recruit from? Well, I'll, I'll start I'll start with the the formation the formation of the of the auxiliary units we refer to as the British Resistance kind of movement because it's a bit more um, Joe public understand that phrase because auxiliary units is so generic it, deliberately, but it, it was set up in Whitehall uh, on the first of July by a guy called Colonel Gubbins who later went on to set up SOE. Colin Gubbins, and he set about putting in place intelligence officers in all the what were going to become operation, the operational counties around the UK. And there's a very good map on our website that shows the uh, the numbers of of patrols, effectively all the coastal counties uh, from Scotland right the way down to Cornwall were operational. So the Orcs units were formed. Uh, the intelligence officers were placed in these counties. But they decided where the patrols were going to be strategically, and they then recruited patrol leaders. A lot of it was done through the Old Boys Network. Quite often the patrol leaders would then recruit their own patrol. So it was all done in a cell structure. So if for the sake of argument I lived in a small town and I was maybe a landowner, maybe I had a bit of First World War experience and I was a trusted, respected gentleman and I was recruited as a patrol leader. The chances are that my patrol members would be the guys that would be working on my farm or my land. The majority of auxiliars were working folk. They were all obviously in reserved occupations, so they had a legitimate reason. But they weren't in jobs like ARP wardens. They weren't in jobs where they had a really, you know, a very focused public facing kind of role. They were they were more kind of melt into the background kind of jobs like looking after pigsties and milking cows and that kind of thing. Were they they giving cover stories? I mean, did people question why they weren't part of the uh, uh, other other, you know, ARPs or, you know? local defence volunteers or anything? Were they given cover stories? The first thing that would have happened is they would have been told, would they like to do something for their country? 
probably in a pub or a meeting, they would have said, well, what do you mean? And the patrol leader would have said, I can't tell you. Sign this piece of paper. They'd sign the Official Secrets Act, and then they'd be told you're part of a secret cell that if the balloon goes up, if the, if the church bells ring, the sound of invasion, we will go to ground and we will cause as much disruption and sabotage as possible. They used the Home Guard uniforms as cover, and whether they were in the Home Guard or not, that would have become their cover story because it gave them a legitimate reason to go off for training. The level of security varied around the country. In Scotland, it seemed a lot more relaxed. In fact, some of the patrols had created a newsletter for certain areas, and there was kind of inter-patrol competitions. But largely, other patrols, especially down south, had no knowledge of other patrols nearby. I mean, it really was on a need-to-know basis. The only time they may have found out more is when they went to Coles Hill, the general headquarters for training. The Scots probably took the uh, threat uh, somewhat more lightly than those uh, in Kent and West Sussex and places that were, which have been you know, very much under threat, well, especially with the you know, sea across the channel at you know, Dover and places. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to point out, of course, these units were formed before... Hitler even prepared Operation Sea Lion before the Battle of Britain began, not long before. The Battle of Britain was on the 10th of July, but Hitler issued Directive 16 for Operation Sea Lion on the 16th of July. So they were sort of 15 days in advance of that directive. So if you imagine you're working on the land, you're a 25-year-old, 19, 25-year-old lad, you've signed the Official Secrets Act, and you've been given a home guard uniform and you've been told these are your duties, effectively, they would then have started training and they would have to have fitted this training around their normal reserved occupation. One of the central places that these patrols would have been located is an operational base. And operational bases were underground Nissen huts, effectively, underground bunkers, largely built by the Royal Engineers in hidden locations, primarily in woodland, primarily on private property. And this operational base would have been their home as soon as we were invaded. And inside these operational bases would have been bunks, food, water, an LSAN toilet, a, a stove, a certain ar a arrangement of equipment and weapons, but not a huge amount of explosives because they would have stored those separately. And they would have gone into this bunker through a hidden entrance, and most of them had an escape tunnel with a hidden exit, and they would have gone into this bunker and stayed there during the day, slept during the day and planned their missions, come out at night, blown up railway lines, bridges ammo dumps, if they'd have had the chance to kill a sentry and make a very messy job of it to frighten and mess with the heads of the Germans, they would have done. And that would have been their life until such time as they were either caught or they took their own lives. So th these are pretty substantial bases, weren't they? I mean, they're real big, solid things. They're not kind of dirty little holes in the ground. It's amazing that you could go into a woodland, dig out such a whacking grit hole. <laughs> build one and then still keep it secret it's a testament to how nobody nobody talked they're phenomenal and there's there was about eight guys in a patrol on average so you can imagine what eight guys in one of these in one of these kind of bunkers will be like but like you said yeah i mean there's accounts of people <laughs> some patrols i mean every patrol brought brought their own angle to their bunker but there's accounts of one patrol putting carpet down a dartboard most of them were given um, like a gallon of rum with with a sealed lid to only open in the event of invasion. And of course, a lot of them stuck a needle in and kind of siphoned out the, the rum and, and filled it with tea. There's also uh, nasty accounts of people almost dying in these places because the ventilation wasn't adequate. It's not an environment that I'd want to spend uh, more than probably one night. How many of them did they build? Well, there were six, about 650 patrols around the country, and each patrol had at least one bunker. So 
at least 650. I think we've published reports on about 75% of the patrols in the UK now, um, and that work is ongoing. And most of those reports have got a mention of the bunker, if not images, uh, videos, all sorts of uh, of information about them. So they're, it's an unprecedented kind of amount of research and, and documentation. What what was um, I have to say? What was the aims and objectives? What was the mission of these guys? So that you know, the, the invasion. They get the they're alerted that the invasion's happening. What 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 is that their aim? What are they tasked to do? Well, the first thing to point out is that they weren't covered under the Geneva Convention. So if they were caught, they were going to be made examples of. Even though they're in uniform? Yeah, because they weren't home guard, effectively. The the uniform was a cover. They were they weren't, were an, unof- an unofficial army, and they still are to this day. You know, I know it's digressing from your point slightly, but the government have never officially acknowledged that they existed, despite the fact that we've walked past... Whitehall on Remembrance Sunday with them uh, three years in a row. The government have never officially acknowledged that they exist, which is something that we're campaigning hard for. But um, no, they weren't. They wouldn't have been covered. So they would have. They would have either taken their own lives or kind of gone down in a in a fight uh, or you know uh, been executed. But the other thing to point out is that these guys were real sons of the soil. They knew that area and the reason they were selected is they knew their area like the back of their hand uh, that by daylight and dark is a phrase that one of them told me they were trained to travel from a to b in the ditches not along the roads not through open fields you know these guys would crawl on their bellies and they knew every ounce of their local area they could live off the land they could hunt they could supplement their rations and they were incredibly well skilled and trained, far more highly trained than your average World War Two soldier. The kit that they had far outweighed the kit that your average soldier had. They had the Thompson submachine gun before anyone else. They used the Pia anti tank uh, weapon before they tested that before anybody else. They had a stupid amount of explosives which they quite often used to blow up trees and all sorts after the war because they had so much of it left over. So they would have known exactly what their goals were within their local area and their specific targets like uh, airfields, railway lines. And you can almost pinpoint an area where a patrol's operational base would be based on the targets that they were likely to take out. So... After they'd done the, the, the list of things that they knew they had to do, then it's a bit of an unwritten book. There are many reports that they had sealed orders and that some of those sealed orders involved individuals that they were supposed to take out. The chief of police would have known an awful lot. Uh, anyone getting too close to the Germans would potentially have been a target uh, how far they would have gone and 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 uh, how long they would have lasted ultimately nobody knows yeah so it's a sabotage force they're not taking on the uh the german army you know from behind it's they they're they're tasked with destroying air bases supply dumps that kind of thing completely guerrilla warfare and sabotage sabotage sums it up really they were trained to with with hand to hand combat but they weren't trained to fight you know, in a in a in a traditional conventional warfare way, one one auxiliar said, "What you what we're asking you to do isn't cricket, but Hitler doesn't play cricket, or something like that." There was three separate training manuals that we that we sell uh, replicas of that were issued to these guys throughout the war, and they were disguised in various ways. But in these training manuals, it shows you how to put a a garrot, you know, how to use a garrot, how to put a uh, a trip wire across the road, how to approach sentries from behind, how to blow up the wings of planes, how to blow up all sorts of things. I mean, it's 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 crazy. How were they trained? Was it weekends and evenings? or Again, it's important to point out that they were run by, ultimately, the military. They were a military-run organisation, which is why in, in November we march with 
the military uh, on Whitehall and we don't march with the civilians because they were trained quite a bit by the Lovett Scouts and the intelligence officers were all serving military and largely they were trained by the military. So they would have done regional training and, and most counties had a regional training headquarters which would have had all the sort of training kit you'd expect. Uh, but they also went to Coles Hill, which is on the Oxfordshire-Wiltshire border, just north of Swindon. And Coles Hill House was a very huge, stately, Palladian mansion with grounds in a very tiny, tiny village. It's not even really a village. It's a road with some houses on it between Highworth, the, the market town of Highworth, and, and a town called Farringdon. And during the war, this road was very quiet. And Coles Hill was taken over the house and grounds to become the UK training headquarters for the British resistance. And the stable blocks were taken over for the admin offices. At weekends, auxiliars would travel to Coles Hill, to Swindon Station, and then take uh, either the branch line to Highworth or would be picked up on a and a lorry and be taken to to Highworth. And this is where it gets really kind of Hollywood. They come to Highworth, and there was Highworth Post Office. None of these guys knew where Coles Hill was. All they were told to was to report to Highworth Post Office. So they get to Highworth Post Office, and there's a very grumpy, and I'm sure her family won't mind me saying this, but a very grumpy postmistress called Mabel Stranks, so they go to Mabel and they give her a code word. It was something like, um, can I have a half halfpenny stamp, but I've only got a shilling or something like that. She would realise that these guys were destined for Coles Hill. She would, if they got the password right, she would telephone Coles Hill because it was only connected via telephone. And a 1500 weight would come and pick them up. And the side, the curtain slides down. It would then drive them all around the houses so they had no idea where they were going. And the reality is it's a five-minute drive up the road. And then they would get to Coles Hill. And the first they'd know about it is the side of the van going up and jumping out and probably a sergeant telling them where to go and, and drop their bags off. Uh, so she vetted them. She vetted every single one that came through. When they sat in their base, in their... Um operating basis how did they coordinate amongst one another or were they even coordinate how, how were they coordinated they weren't once once they had gone to ground there wouldn't be any communication with as far as we're aware there was no communication uh, there on end they were on their own the the royal signals were working on the development of um, the radio network now separate to the operational patrols was an organization called the special duties branch now the special duties branch was effectively a an observational uh, radio network all over the country and basically their role was to monitor uh, troop movement post invasion so you would have like sleeper cells in the community that would have been trained to have, how to count vehicles, how to count troops, what certain vehicles were. They would then write a message that would go into something like a split, a tennis ball with a split in it. They'd then take that tennis ball to a, a location and leave it. Or it might have been a message that was put into a bolt a hollowed out bolt that was then put into a fence post and left. And that's all they do. So they'd report the movement, report anything untoward. They would put a message in this dead letter drop and they'd leave it. And then there was the radio network that then took that message and passed those messages on. Largely they were run by the ATS ladies of serving ATS officers, and they would message. There were, the, it's, it's quite a complicated network, but there was different types of, of radio station. There was in stations and out stations. But the long and the short of it is that the messages would be relayed to a zero station, which was kind of like uh, the top of the tree within that county. 
uh, and the zero station would then relay that message back to the powers that be. But this information wasn't being fed back to the auxiliary units. So who was going where and in what numbers was a separate transfer of data run by a separate kind of uh, organisation. But auxiliary unit patrols, generally speaking, had no idea about this radio network. Somehow seems a bit disjointed. You thought it would be designed to sort of at least feed them back some information so they could maybe try and uh, organise pointed resistance to coincide with other things perhaps so they were just expected to counterattack until they ran out of steam yeah i mean the operational patrols quite a few of them had observational posts which were some distance away from their operational base and that would be connected via a telephone so during the day you'd have someone watching sat in that observational post which is about the size of a phone box underground with a camouflage roof and you'd be sat there on OBS looking for anything untoward, or if, if you saw a patrol coming through the woods, then you'd alert the guys in the operational base and, you know, they'd get the hell out of Dodge. But that was pretty much it. You know, the, other than that, there was no other comms. Now, there were a few op- operational bases set up. There was one famous one in Kent, which was like a super operational base, and it was designed for auxiliaries that were on the run. Where they it's somewhere that they could come together, but Kent was the very first test bed really for Orcs units. There was a training house there called the Garth, which we've got a, a page on on the site, which was where the very first intelligence officers went there after the auxiliary units were formed. Peter Fleming, Ian Fleming's brother, was very very influential in the formation of uh, and development of Orcs units at that early stage. And a lot of that happened at this house called the Garth in Kent. And the patrols in Kent were the ver- first ones formed before it then spread out across the country. And if they're doing these guerrilla attacks, were they ever prepared or briefed on what to do in the face of, you know, we now, you know, after the event, they might not have known it at the time, but the, you know, the German reprisals against civilians, uh, against, you know, in, in reaction to a guerrilla attacks. Were they briefed? Were they told what to expect? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, there are there are course notes for the patrol leaders on how to deal with certain elements of discipline and things like how to deal with the morale in the operational base and this kind of thing, when your guys can smoke, when they can't smoke. But I, I, I've not personally... I mean, some of our researchers around the country may have may have more knowledge of this, but no, it, in terms of the reprisal aspect has always fascinated me because well, when I first started this group and when I got into auction units for the first time, I was uh, I hadn't even got married then. And the reality of it would be that I would have to have, if I was an auxiliar, I would have to have just disappeared there was no leaving a note for your wife. There was no saying goodbye. You literally put down your your pitchfork and walked to your operational base. Let's be honest, the stark reality is you probably would never have been seen again. Or if you were seen again, you were going to be hung from a from a telegraph pole in the middle of the in the middle of the town that you lived in for all to see. When people say to me, Oh, these guys didn't do anything really, yeah, they trained for they trained hard, but, you know, they didn't see any real action. Well, first of all, one or two auxiliars did die in training through through the explosives. And secondly, I don't think it should be underestimated how hard they had to train whilst also doing a ni- normal nine to five, if there was such a thing during the war, but also what they were prepared to walk away from and the fact that they were prepared to give their life for for king and country and they spent a lot of time in these operational bases training and they must have had an awful lot of time to think what will happen to my wife when the germans find out that i'm missing and that they put two and two together after these attacks you know what are they going to do to my wife to try and smoke me out you know did they were they briefed on what to do in the or trained what to do in the case of uh, capture well the official line is you don't get captured. 
if if I had been captured and my other patrol members had the opportunity to take me out, they wouldn't have had any choice but to have done that because of what I knew. It was made very clear that if one of the guys got injured on a mission, that he was to be dispatched because he couldn't be left knowing what he knew. He could give up the location of the operational base. Likewise, if anyone did know where that operational base was, they would have to have been taken out straight away because they would have compromised their whole mission. Could they have actually done it? That's another discussion. You know, if that was your uncle that had found your your bunker and you knew that you had to put a bullet in him because he, he had that information, I don't know. You know, it's, it's not for me to say <laughs> whether they could have done that or not. But mm. Yeah, well, it just seemed to be almost like a suicide mission, just keep going until, well, you run out of ammunition and explosives or you're caught. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Most of them said they didn't really think about that. They trained for it. They, they didn't dwell too much on, on the end of what may happen. I think they kind of thought that they'd just do their thing and, you know, and that would be that. Did they go on exercises? Did they, how did they perform if they, you know, they must have sent them off against presumably real targets. You know, I said real. Yeah, I mean, they, they train very heavily and very often. Quite often they'd uh, be sent to a, a live airfield and they'd have to chalk mark uh, the side of a fuel dump or a plane, you know, various different things. They they often messed with the local guards and sentries and, and kind of got them in trouble because it showed a massive hole in their security. They would go into stately homes and kind of put chalk marks on people's beds while they were still asleep in them. And, yeah, they, they, they trained in all different types of uh, scenarios, uh, primarily explosive-related and charge, you know, putting charges on things, blowing up railway lines uh, and all that kind of thing. But they had competitions at Coles Hill when they did, they did meet there. So that, so say, for example, two or three patrols in Sussex that had trained hard would go to Coles Hill and would compete to try and, uh, you know, beat another patrol. And there's quite a few guys out there that have got pewter mugs that, that they won in kind of competitions. Most auxiliars went to Coles Hill at least once during the war, maybe twice for training. But most of the training was done either by the patrol leader and then he trained his men or it was done regionally. They were eventually stood down in 44. And you've said they didn't, you've mentioned they didn't receive any, uh, they've never really received any uh, rec- recognition. Um, but why Why was there secret? I mean, because they were, they were kept... Uh, but it was being a secret. It's been hit, it's not been in, in uh, general knowledge for. Actually, there's been a huge amount of mentions of the auxiliary units. I think it was either the Times or the Telegraph. There was a mention of them, I believe, in 1945. It was really when uh, the Last Ditch came out by David Lamp in the 60s, and he'd researched it thoroughly and spoken to everybody really. And at that point, people started talking. Because they thought, well, the book's out. I remember they all signed the Official Secrets Act. So they were governed, they were bound by 50 years to not say anything anyway. And a huge amount of auxiliars that, that we've chatted to have either been off the record or uh, we've contacted auxiliars knowing full well what they've been involved with and they refuse to speak to us. And, and of course, most of them took their secrets to the grave and never told their family. We had someone the first year we marched on Whitehall. He told his family, I think, about three, four weeks before he marched, and they had no idea. So the secrecy aspect, you know, even to this day, a lot of the, the, the few that are still alive, quite a few of them won't, won't speak to us. Tom, before we look at the Coles Hill Auxiliary Research Team, if we could just take a moment for a word from our sponsor, Hillsdale College. Our friends at Hillsdale are running a free online course looking at one of the greatest leaders of the 20th century, Winston Churchill. I've said it before, I'm a big fan of online courses. You can do them in your own time and at your own pace, downloading each week's lectures. You can find more details at hillsdale.edu slash 
WW2 podcast. Almost a million people have taken Hillsdale's renowned courses, such as Constitution 101, American Heritage. As a history fan, I'm sure you won't want to miss this one. So, for exclusive access, go to hillsdale.edu slash WW2 podcast and sign up today. Tom, so tell us about the Coles Hill Auxiliary Research Team, which I think you set up. I did, yeah. I mean, in a nutshell... um... Uh, I live very close to Coles Hill and my girlfriend, when we drove past the walls of the, the grounds and, and, and she mentioned that secret army was trained in these grounds and, and I came away and there was nothing online really about it at that time, but I did find one or two people that were, had researched it. And there was a couple of good books that had been written by a guy called John Warwicker. So I set up a really basic website just for me to start compiling sources of information and bits and pieces. And basically people started finding it. I then kind of said, well, why don't we all come together with a few common goals? And that's what's happened. And um, at its peak, we had, I think, 12 or 13 researchers around the country. It's dropped down a bit now. We've covered about 75% of the of those 650 patrols and uh, it'll be nice to to get all the names up we've got a an internal archive of about 15,000 documents uh, which as i said are internal at this stage but that our researchers have access to and then they translate that into published patrol reports most of the of the listed auxiliaries in the UK and now on our site in one way or another. So you can keyword search for them. But as a group, we uh, we organise events around the country and we research all aspects of, of what they did, basically. And we're always looking for anyone that's keen to either get involved in their county or help on a kind of a national basis. It is the many documents survive. Yeah, there is. There's a lot and they're kind of all scattered everywhere. I mean, the, the Imperial War Museum and the National Archive have got the lion's share. A lot of it isn't filed in a way that is easy to find. You can't go along really and just type in auxiliary units and all the documents come up. You have to really think you have to look under stores and you have to look under signals and lots of different avenues in order to get pieces of that jigsaw and you know massive respect to the to the team that that go and do this because they spend hours and hours photographing and collating all this stuff and of uh, 15,000 documents it's just immense but because uh, you know there's various different levels of of approval and copyright on a lot of this material we we can't just make it a publicly searchable database but what we can share with the public and, and time permitting we do share the most important thing for us is to try and document any surviving members and 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 record their stories and get them on camera and on our homepage at the moment there's a there's a video with Trevor Miners who was a patrol member in Perrinporth and we brought him up to Coles Hill last year and he opened an observational post and then we got him firing a Sten gun and he went into the replica operational base and oh I mean it just it just made his day. But he was just like a nineteen year old, you know, he was just in his element. You know, days like that make it all worthwhile. I've um I've been trying to find um sites near me on your website. I've just moved from London to rural Yorkshire and was disappointed to find uh, there, were, there, are ne- there are not any directly uh, close to me. Um, there are a few in the, I'm in the Vale of York, there are a few on the moor tops, but none actually in the, vale of, in the Vale of York. Well, the other thing to point out, which I'm sure you know, but quite a lot of people completely forget, is that the roads weren't the same as they are now. The networks of, of how to get from A to B were completely different back then. For example, in Sussex, the A272 that runs from kind of Winchester through to Brighton, I think, Worthing, all the patrols were pretty much scattered either side of the A272, which is still an important road. But there are roads that now aren't as important that were really important then. And it might be in your store, in your case, that it doesn't now make any sense whatsoever 
but you've only got to put one building in that one place or one thing there, and then it all drops into place. A classic example of that is in Herefordshire, where if you look at the Orcs patrols in Herefordshire, they're in almost a circle, and it and it seems a little bit odd that they're located in the way that they're located. But then when you look at where the uh, royal family were going to be taken in the event of an invasion, it's smack bang in the middle of that ring of auxiliary unit patrols. And again, why would you put, why would you have those patrols in that area where it's not a coastal county? It makes no real sense. It doesn't tick any of the other boxes. And yet then you understand the auxiliary units were up in Balmoral. They, were, they lived in the grounds of Balmoral. The Queen referred to one of them as the Tweed Side Farmer, and she knew him by name. And, and her and Princess Margaret used to try and find them because they'd hide in ghillie suits in the, in the grounds, and they used to try and find them. You know, so. it, 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 it's, um, frightfully, it's frightfully exciting as well because you're actually finding bunkers that have been lost, and everybody loves a pillbox and a bunker or, you know, these Atlantic wall, these things, they're solid structures, they're not t- t- tills, are they? These bunkers are being discovered by our guys regularly that have not been in, you know, people have not been in them before. That must be frightfully exciting the first time you go in one that's been uh, mothballed. Yeah, I mean, I've been in a fair few, but only ones that our team have already gone into. There's one particular location which is still very top secret. And you've got to remember nearly all of these are on private property, so we have to persuade a landowner to let us access it. There's one that was a zero station for the special duties branch, which has still got all the desks in. It's a real, real find. Finding it's one thing, then persuading someone to let you go in it is another thing, uh, and then letting you them letting you put it, make it public. Obviously, we don't say the exact locations of any of them because that would just be ridiculous. But the guys doing this, are, are, they start kind of <laughs> climbing a mountain before they've even got got anywhere, you know. So, if if um, people want to get involved, how can they how can they get involved and help? Well, the website is staybehinds.com. So the best place is to come on there and uh, there's a donate button. If you click on that, you can donate in either financially or you can donate with from you know from a time point of view, or you can become a friend of our of our group, which lasts for a year, and you get a newsletter and other bits and pieces uh, if you wanted to support our work. Um, but really, from a from a volunteering point of view, you can help from literally trying to get some of our flyers in your local museum right through to effectively becoming a full-on researcher in, in, in a county if we don't already have a, somebody in that area. But you can, you can get involved to whatever level you want with marketing, with uh, PR. You know, There's all sorts of different things if, if it's a topic that interests you. You can find more information on the Coles Hill Auxiliary Research Team at staybehinds.com. There is masses of information on the units, uh, where they were, and some great links to documentaries and interviews uh, with some of those who served in the units. Tom, thanks for joining me. Don't forget, you can follow the podcast on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes, and you can also find me on TuneIn Radio. All links can be found at www.podcast.com. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.